Doc on the Run. We help injured runners run. Uh, today on the Doc on the Run podcast, we're talking with Julia Curran, who's an age group national high jump champion about preventing running injuries as you experience rapid running success. All right, Julia. So, you know, we're here today and we're discussing the perils of rapid success with you, who is a USATF Masters National Champion high jumper. And I'm glad you've come on the podcast just to share your story today. So thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I, I'm really glad that you're going to be here. I think you have a really inspiring story, and uh, I think it's going to help a lot of our listeners today. So before we really get started uh, talking about your circumstances and all of your athletic you know, injuries and, and dealing with injuries uh, that you have had that you can share with us, maybe you could just share with our audience a little bit about your athletic background, how you got into high jumping, and what running has meant to you up to the present day. Well, I started high jumping in high school in ninth grade. I was 14 years old and I had great success in high school, but um, I never jumped after high school. I didn't jump through college. Um, I picked it up again 35 years later when I was 53. Um, When I was 50, I was actually in a car accident that was pretty bad, but I walked away. And at that point I thought, gosh, if you wanna try anything, in this life, you better do it now because time is short. I felt so lucky. So I literally Googled track and field for grownups because I so enjoyed being a track athlete when I was in high school. And I found USATF Masters and found that, in fact, they do have track and field. So um, that was in 2013. And I found a meet. I went to a meet with no training and no practice. And I jumped in one. So after 35 years, that muscle memory would, must have still been there. And um, from that point on, so that's uh, five, six years ago now, um, I have been in the master's track and field community. I devoted more time to it after that first year. And I um, had a pretty rapid road to success. And um, for three years, I was the indoor and outdoor national champion. And then in 2018, uh, last year, I turned to the pentathlon to challenge myself. So it's been a wild ride. <laughs> wow. Well, that, that's interesting. I mean, first of all, you know, the idea of doing high jumping as a response to having a serious automobile accident is pretty unusual. Uh, most people wouldn't think they would do something like that. Imagine many people would take up something that seems sort of less arduous, less impactful, you know, like swimming or something, but you went back to something you knew. And incredibly, like you said, the muscle memory was still there and something that really does require a lot of muscle memory, technical expertise, all of that. You were very successful right away, which is highly unusual. And, you know, the idea of having sort of this successful athletic career that really kind of begins or blossoms when you're in your 40s or 50s, I think it's fairly common with endurance athletes, but that's only because many endurance athletes have sort of continued to do endurance sports just sort of in the, you know, in the background. And then they, for whatever reason, have a lot more time to really dedicate just, just time on the ground, time training, time and hours that builds a massive base of aerobic fitness. And then they can be very successful, but high jumping is different. So track Obviously, you really need to be good at that thing. You have to have some talent, some experience. You know, if, for me personally, I was never a high jumper. So there's no way I could show up and start high jumping and be successful at it. But you did that. And, and again, you said it was in response to this sort of idea of, you know, realizing that life is short. Uh, and that is pretty unusual. So most of the other high jumpers that you were competing with when you returned, had most of them stuck with it and been doing it for a long time, do you think? Yes, a lot of them had. And that was really exciting as a, let's say I entered this as a non-athlete, um, to be jumping with people who had been collegiate athletes, people who had been national champions for a long time, people who had been Olympians, people who had been um, you know, on the Olympic team, you know, all round athletes. It was, it was really exciting. And um, I, I couldn't believe it was, it was happening. It was, it it was really cool. It was really awesome. So um, it, it really opened, opened the window into what people had been doing for 30 years. And on that point, I think one thing that actually ratcheted my success up so quickly as well was I had what I call fresh legs. A lot of the people that show up at master's events, 
they're wearing a knee brace, they have an elbow support, you know, they're dealing with a chronic injury. And uh, I didn't have any, because I hadn't been doing anything for 30 years. So I didn't have wear and tear on the body. I still believe that even though I have this um, tendon, chronic tendonitis, I still believe that I am fresher um, out of the box here, because I don't have 30 years uh, under me. But um, it did mean that I also didn't have years and years of dealing with injuries, and I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting. But it's a good point, right? Most um, of the athletes I see, they've been in this sort of continuous grind. And I personally believe that, you know, most of the people I see are endurance athletes. And I, I think most of them, and I really do believe it's most of them, are chronically overtrained just because we, you know, do long events. We think that you need to have tons of hours all the time. And I, I don't really know that that's true. But I do think it's it's true that when athletes are in their 40s and 50s, many of them have been accustomed to overtraining in a sense. And so we believe that it's normal. And you show up and you're basically competing them, like you said, with with fresh legs, which is really great. But even in that scenario, you can get injured. So let's talk about running injuries. And, and most running injuries, I think, really only happen in two scenarios. The first thing is we do something stupid, something that's foolhardy, something we know that we should not have done. And in that case, when we get a running injury, it's kind of like this slap on the wrist. You know, it's, it's really, but that's really only a fraction of all running injuries. What I really think happens with most runners is actually an injury sustained while pushing for progress. It happens when we're getting stronger. We're pushing ourselves to the limit and we push just a little too far. And, you know, as you said, you experienced rapid success in your running career when you returned. And when we look at you know, normal runners like us, when we look at somebody who's an athlete like you, who is a champion, who is successful, somebody who is showing their success on social media, and we see these pictures that seem so inspiring, you know, athletes like you, it looks like everything's working perfectly, but anyone can get injured. And in fact, for those athletes who do experience rapid success, it can be even more difficult to restrain yourself when you're getting these little subtle clues from your body that you might be heading for an overtraining injury. So, What's been your experience with rapid athletic success and the difficulty in noticing those subtle initial signs that may really tell you you're heading for an overtraining injury? I think social media is a, is a good point uh, to make. I think that, that, um, that we do see a lot of images of people training. And it's easy to sit on your phone and, and post a training photo every day. But that athlete may not, in fact, be training every day. So I think you make a really good point there. but. For masters, whether you were a successful competitive athlete when you were younger or you always wanted to be one and now you have your second chance, I think that the giddiness of success can really interfere with some healthy, good common sense. And training while at a high level of pain is not a good idea. And I know that now. I think when you pick something up later in life, you know, in some cases, like me, I was just winging it. And I didn't know which muscles or tendons I was actually putting under stress. I think that educating yourself about your muscles and tendons and what you're doing is important. I actually got the USATF level one certification to actually coach myself so that I had a little bit more of an understanding of what it was like, what, what stresses I was putting on my body. For example, you're slamming seven times your body weight on your jump foot when you leap up in the air. Mm. So that was important for me to understand. So educating yourself, I think that can help, help you maintain a certain sense of understanding of what you're doing while you have that rapid athletic success. You know what, many of us as adults, we're used to just, if we have an injury, we put a bandaid on it. We cut ourselves or we scrape ourselves um, we just put a bandaid on it and we keep on moving. But when it comes to running, training, jumping, um, you need to, to really pay attention to that stress that you're putting on your body. Oh, that's a good point. I mean, and like you say, it's not easy to do when you, you know, make all this progress because you really would like to just ignore that trouble. And that's a pretty common response, truthfully, with athletes. But I think it is worse when you really do notice this 
success that's happened. It's just so hard to let go of that. And you think and you fear oh, yeah. that, you know, it's just going to, if you stop exercising, you stop training or whatever, you're, that your chance is going to kind of vanish. That's necessarily, not necessarily true. And oh, right now. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I yeah. remember, I remember the, the first person I saw, the first orthopedic surgeon I saw about my tendons. Um, he sat across the table from me and said, okay, so what I need you to do is shut it down. And that was a year, a year, uh, a year and a half ago. And I said, what? And he said, oh, I need you to shut it down or else this is going to get worse. And I remember sitting there and telling him, wait a second, I've got indoor nationals. I'm number one in the U.S. I have to maintain my ra- ranking throughout my indoor and outdoor season. I'm 57 at that point. And I have two more years in this age group. I remember sitting there and rationalizing my training. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just a certain part of the brain says, I can't stop. (laughs) So I'll be smarter now. But the the advice is to listen to the medical professionals. Well, you know, but this is where the difficulty comes in. And there are certain personality types that take to these kind of athletic endeavors. And you know, good or bad, part of what makes us successful in athletics also can put us at risk. And, you know, and that stuff is pretty common. There's there are reasons why, you know, many people want to hire and employ people who have athletic backgrounds. You know, they understand this idea of making sacrifices to get something to work. And I mean, in my residency, for example, like all the people that want to do a surgical res- residency are prepared to not sleep for days on end to work a hundred and something hours a week in residency and, and also do a really grueling routine to get there. Um, Mm -hmm. But that of course we know it, we know for a fact, it's not good for you to stay up for two or three days straight seeing patients or doing, you know, surgery. Um, But it's a sacrifice that we have decided we can make. And then that sort of bleeds into our athletic lives where we think, well, it hurts, but so what? I can toughen up. I can ignore it. I can, you know, think I can protect it when I'm doing this athletic activity and, and it will still be fine. And, and that's just not true. And, and of course, like it or not, the older we are, the more difficult it is for our bodies to actually heal as quickly as when we were younger. And, you know, right now there are runners out there listening to this who are in their 40s and 50s. We have lots of listeners who are in their 40s and 50s who are doing endurance events, who are runners, who are athletes of different varieties. Some of those people have been winning races for decades and others are just kind of now starting to experience this sort of second chance in their athletic lifetimes like like you got. So what sort of special considerations do you think masters athletes in particular have to pay attention to if they want to avoid these kind of overtraining injuries? Okay, here's a really big one that I strongly believe in. In 2017, I hired a strength coach. And he worked with me to do weight training. And by the end of 2017, I felt I was so strong. I felt like I could lift a bus. He worked very hard to make sure that my joint strength was there. Uh, he was a track and field weight coach. And actually, I'm back with him now. Because in 2018, I decided to challenge myself even more and become a pentathlete. What I kind of didn't realize is I was, I was moving from one event to five. So I was increasing my training by five um, and I put my financial resource towards a track coach instead of a weight coach. And I look back on that now and realize the lack of weight training done during 2018 may have led to my injury, uh, probably did lead to my injury. So what I would say for even your endurance athletes and your road runners and your sprinters and your distance and your 5k people do not go without strength training, weight training as masters athletes, people in their 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. I think that the wear and tear on the body can be mitigated slightly with a good, strong skeleton, a good, strong core. And you get that through weight training. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, I believe firmly that the, one of the things that causes running injuries is not running, but it's weakness. And you know, runners want to run. They don't want to do strength training. They don't want to go to the gym. There's a perception that if you go to the gym and you build muscle mass, it's just extra weight for you to carry when you run, which is absurd. Yeah. 
But that is yeah. a common, I think, sort of unspoken misconception among many runners that they really think, no, I need to spend my time running. I don't need to go to the gym and because then I'll gain weight and that'll be worse for me. And it's just not true. You know, but all runners know that it takes lots of effort to get to fitness. And some of them think that that is just running and not going to a, a gym. And they really think it's about aerobic fitness. And we know that it can take years to build a truly solid foundation with your aerobic fitness. And then once you have that, it can take many months of seriously focused effort to peak for a single portion of a season in one year, like you're talking about. You know, you had made this um, massive improvement. And then when you got injured, you're thinking, well, I still have this and this for the rest of my my season that I have to really focus on because I only have two more years in this age group. And it makes it very difficult to notice those signs. So why do you think it's so hard for athletes to notice those signs of an overtraining injury when you're in the middle of that high level of fitness? Why do you think that is? Well, I can speak to the older athletes, the master's athletes, and it's my philosophy that there are three kinds of master's athletes. The first kind is the kind who competed in college at an elite level and kept on going. And these athletes, most of the time, understand how their body has changed over time. Mm. And I think when they hear, when they see an injury or when they feel things aren't right, they may back off. Um, they may be able to listen to their body more. There's a second type of athlete who was very successful in college, maybe went to Olympic trials, et cetera, and then stopped for 20 years. And it's now back at it in their late 40s or early 50s or what have you. They may still think they have the body they did when they were in their the height of their career. And those people, I think there might be a misconception between mind and body. And then you have the third kind of master's athlete, which is me. I didn't do anything for 35 years. I was giddy with excitement about a second chance at competition. And I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just winging it on muscle memory and technique. And I think I was a, not able to understand what was going on. And that's why I kept training through, through the injury and through these, these markers that were saying, hey, that pain every time, after you, every time you get after your high jump, I think you might need to take a look at it. I think the other thing that adult athletes suffer from is something called investment guilt. Mm. We're at it. We're competing at a time when we have discretional income and the final, the financial resources to be able to travel to competition, sometimes internationally. We take time off from our work and our careers. We buy airline tickets. We make arrangements for people to take care of our kids or our family members. And once we invest so much time and energy in these plans, it can be heart-wrenching to cancel them. I was on track to go to the World Masters Championships in Spain last fall, and I probably would have gone, but I was basically at that point hobbled. I, I, I came off the track um, from outdoor nationals last year, and um, I couldn't really go forward anymore. So when you make all those plans and you have all those financial investments, I think that adult athletes sometimes find it hard to say no to that race that's ahead of them because they've, they've invested time and money. And as well, the three different types of master's athletes, you know, some are still living in the past and some um, are just so new to it that they're not aware of, of what injuries are. Oh, that's really interesting. I've never thought about it that way. But I know that, you know, I see athletes all the time who have this fear of the in, losing the investment in terms of the amount of time they've put in. But I think there is something to that. All of these events, like you say, they're very expensive. And if you do Ironman races, well, it's, you know, approaching $1,000 just for the entry fee. Then you have to have an expensive bike. You have to travel with the bike. That costs a lot of money. It's always, you know, these places are usually at expensive areas. Like if you do an Ironman in France and you have to stay in Nice, well, it is not inexpensive to go and stay in Nice for a week or so. And, you know, and, and we, many times these are non-refundable um, airline tickets. And there's also this idea that, well, you know, I've been training for a year to do this race. I, and you have this yeah. idea that you're basically, if you don't do the event, you're throwing away a year of investment. Uh, and yeah. But it is true. I think there's a, a lot to that. 
Uh, you know, but I also know one of the things that that really throws athletes off is this belief that our fitness is all about effort and discipline. And we want to believe it's just about hard work and dedication. After many years of working with injured runners, I've concluded really that injury and recovery are both more about emotion than they are about discipline. So what can you share about emotions and our definitions of ourselves as athletes that can become so bound up in our current fitness level? I think that that competing at a high level is a very emotional experience and you get very attached to that success and it's very much a part of who you are. It's your personal brand and to let go of that for a month or a year or two years is extremely difficult. It would be just like at work. You're, you're kind of passing over on a, passing up a promotion uh, because you know that there's something better down the track. That, that would be, if you, if you stop training in order to heal, that's kind of what you're doing. I think it's a very emotional thing to train at a high level. You, you have to make sacrifices. You work very hard. You're juggling a lot of things. The idea of stopping can be very scary. In addition, if you're an older athlete, you're, um, you're very bound up in your youth. You look younger than other people. You're doing things younger than other people. And, you know, I was saying to my sons the other day that when I would play a tennis match, um, which I kind of used for cross training, if we won, I would leap over the, the uh, tennis net at just because I could. Right. And um, I didn't think much about it. But now I'm thinking, gosh, you know, I'm in my 50s and I'm doing that. So you, you have a certain joie de vivre and a certain youth about you. And you get very bound up in, that, in the emotion of that. And even if your body's warning you, you have this injury, you need to back off the training. You get so bound up in how you, in your success, that, that you uh, may not back off and give yourself time to recover. And I've really learned for master's athletes, for older athletes, sometimes less really can be more. Um, I was more successful when I was running less. I was more successful when I was training less. I really pushed myself in 2018. I was really overtraining and I ended up injured. Mm. That's a good point. I mean, I recently did an interview with Mark Allen and, and, you know, obviously Ironman, you have to train a lot and you can't win six world championships if you're not really training effectively. And he talked a lot about how that's really the, the biggest problem is that, you know, when he started doing it, there, there were no training methods like there are now. Nobody really know what to do because that was a brand new event. The idea of doing that much training volume it had just not existed before. And, and still to this day, though, there's sort of this mythology around, you know, putting all of the work in and training more and suffering and so on. And it's pervasive in athletic competition. And it really does lead, I think, to a lot of problems with athletes getting injured unnecessarily. Now, and I think, so, and I think social media contributes to that, too. Oh, I think so, for sure. For sure. And know, just, it's, it's yeah. So two people, you know, leaping over six hurdles 10 times over, you think, you know, maybe I need to go out and leap over 60 hurdles every mm -hmm. training session. And that may not be the case. <laughs> no, it's true. And, you know, and there was, a, I actually saw, um, I noticed on someone's Instagram post recently where it, it brought up that I thought about this when you mentioned this earlier about how athletes will post their workouts, you know, seven days a week, and they're not actually training seven days a week. And I was looking at this one and a woman who is, you know, has a huge following on social media. I was looking at it and I realized that like indisputably, if you look at the images and they're spread out, you know, they're all every day, there's a workout with her doing some huge long run. And when I was looking at it, I realized that many of the pictures that are dispersed throughout her feed well, they're, they're, it looks like it's you know five days later, but if you actually look at it closely, you can tell for sure. You could see this one spot on her uh, top, and it's uh -huh. from the same run. And she has it posted you know, on multiple weeks, but it's from the same run. So she actually could not have been doing that run that day because she previously posted pictures, and the cloud scatter is the same. Uh, the cloud scatter mm -hmm. is not going to be the same a week later. 
and it does, you know, a lot of people do that. It's misleading, but they're putting these pictures up as if they had just gone for this run when actually it could have been a week before, a month before, or something else. And it isn't a beautiful place and it's inspiring and all that sort of stuff, but it's also misleading. And that is a big problem when we're comparing how we feel inside versus the way that someone provokes it on social media can really be a problem. That's you know, sure. that's really that's really interesting you bring that up because, um, you know, I'm a freelance photographer. And one thing that I have to be very careful with is photoshopping I- images. Mm. And because because when you work with actresses and models, you need to make them look good, but you need to make them look real. Mm. or else they're going to show up in an interview not looking like themselves <laughs> and um it, it it's fascinating because um you know you have to have a very light hand but uh it's it's similar what you're discussing now it's very similar that that it, this unrealistic expectation of training the, where people actually look uh indestructible mm-hmm. people look um as if they're um you know, they're, they're confidently running through their day, you know, that, that can really be an issue for, for athletes who are in the business of training. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, aside from just, you know, putting in the work and all of that, one of the things that we as athletes all know works is visualizing your outcome. So for marathon runners, I've seen this over and over where I'll go see someone and they will have posted, you know, because I do house calls. And sometimes when I see patients, runners when at house calls, they'll have their marathon goal time actually pasted on their computer or on their refrigerator, you know, and there's a lot of value in that, I think, in visualizing your outcome. And I would imagine being a high jumper, something that is so technique dependent that when you literally just think about the actual movements and the sequence of movements that has to facilitate a successful jump you're visualizing your outcome and that is part of the training for the event and we believe you know we have to be confident in our ability to achieve our athletic goals and that sort of visualization and the belief and confidence in that really is essential to achieving the goal but that confidence can also be a double edged sword if we become too confident then we kind of become overzealous because we think we can do it. We think we can just make it through and then we get injured. So what can you tell us about these feelings of being invincible, feeling indestructible, or maybe even being overconfident and how those feelings actually can jeopardize your health? Well, I think visualizing is is very important for high jumps. Uh, I always visualize um, a successful jump. Um, if you ever watch me jump, you can see I do take a moment and I, I hit those 14 points before I, I fly over the bar mentally before I jump. Um, and a lot of high jumping is confidence. It's an event where you sit, stand there and you watch everybody else perform. You watch them from standing from the side. You're not in the race with them. So emotionally, you do have to have a lot of confidence. Um, overconfidence is awesome in competition, but I think it can be detrimental to keeping you healthy because uh, if you feel you're indestructible, then you're going to continue to train through a, a tweak or an injury that's telling you it's time to stop. And, uh, you know, com- being a competitive athlete, it's all about confidence. It's all about, I own this. I've got this. My natural athleticism will will take me through this, um, and that can be detrimental to staying healthy because you think you're invincible and you're Superman and and can't be hurt. So, especially for masters athletes, we're all so excited to be competing at this age. That excitement can hold us back from some some healthy common common sense. I think. Mm, yeah, I think that 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 makes a lot of sense. Now. I know earlier you alluded to this injury that you had where you started noticing some pain and some um, trouble and then developed kind of a chronic tendonitis type thing. And this might be a little for, difficult for you to discuss because nobody really wants to talk about injuries. And so we don't have to dive into this too much if you don't want to, but I know you've had some issues with perineal tendonitis and perineal tendon injuries in particular can be notoriously difficult for runners to resolve. So uh, if you want to talk about that, maybe you can just share with us about 
kind of how your perineal tendon issues started and you know, whether it was one specific event or, a, or if you think it was a series of small events that eventually cascaded into the trouble. I, I'm sorry for other people that have this tendonitis, but I'm, I'm kind of happy to hear that it's a, a very difficult issue to resolve because I've been dealing with it now for a year and a half. And it was small events that started this. So listeners, please listen to me that I initially felt a little bit of discomfort underneath my left jump foot, my left ankle every time I high jumped. And I kind of, you know, uh, ignored it and it would go away after a day or so. And then I had a snapping feeling, even as I would walk around the house, um, the the ankle would kind of snap and I would have a very sharp pain and I would kind of think, oh my goodness, what was that? I would sit down, I would massage it for a while and I started to get concerned. I don't know when that's going to happen, that snapping thing. And um, what if I'm ready to go to an international competition and that happens and, and I need to do this thing where I massage it for about 24 hours and it gets back to normal. And that's when I saw a doctor and that's when the doctor said, hey, you need to shut this down because I think it's going to be a problem for you. I didn't listen to him. I said, I think I'm going to be okay. I got orthotics and I began to train for the pentathlon because at that point he had said to me, you know, the curving motion of high jump is exacerbating this problem. So you need to stop high jumping. And I said, you don't say that to a national champion. <laughs> and he said, no, you know, you need to focus on inline events. So that's when I started training for the pentathlon, not realizing that I was upping my training by five because I was going from one event to five events. And I spent a lot of time running, a lot of time on the track. And as a high jumper, you do a lot of plyometrics and a lot of strength training and a lot of flexibility training. And I moved into a lot of running and a lot of jumping over hurdles. And a lot of sprinting, 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 you know, 10, 50s, 5, 100s, and 2, 200, 300 meters, 300 meter, 600 meter. And my ankle started to hurt about an hour after my, my workout, and it would continue to hurt unless I kept moving on it. Mm. And so, uh, unbeknownst to me, that is tendonitis, that you... It feels better. You're lulled into a false sense of security. It feels better when you use it. So you think, right. oh, I'll just use it. Oh, oh, okay. Well, this works for me because I know when I get to the track and I warm up for 10 minutes and I keep running during my workout, I did not have pain. In the car ride home, that 30 minutes home, when I got out of the car, I was in a lot of pain. It just got worse and worse and worse. And then by the time in July that I, I hit, national, it was a, a lot of pain. And I mean, I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, but then I was put in a boot in the fall. And uh, I wasn't told when I came out of the boot, and this is a, something really important, maybe you stress that in your, this in your podcast, but I was unaware that four weeks in a boot, that I would come out of that and not be able to return to normal activity. Right. And I was told, I was told, Okay, so your pain's all gone? Yes. Oh, that's exciting. Great. Okay, good. You're 98% pain free. Yep. Okay, good. Well, now you can go to normal activity. You're you're good. We we did it. You're great. The first weekend out of that boot, I was in more pain than when I'd gone in. Right. And it's because I know now it's because those ortho boots. The, you atrophy 60%. I think I might be repeating your words because that's oh, yeah. how I found you. Is that the ortho boot reduces your strength so much. And I returned to normal activity, in quotes. And I did something else. And I don't know what it is. So I called the doctor and said, I have another pain. I have a different pain on the side. And I have all kinds of pains. And he said, Go back in the boot for two weeks. So I went back in the boot. And it's never never really gotten better. <laughs> yeah, no, so, the boots, uh, yeah, the boots are terrible. So I, I, I know that it is the most common treatment, basically, and four to six weeks of a boot is kind of the standard routine. But what I speak about over and over and over is that um, 
you just can't do that. I mean, I'm giving a lecture in a couple of weeks at the International Foot and Ankle Foundation meeting in Las Vegas, which is their biggest meeting, you know, for sports medicine, podiatrists, foot and ankle surgeons, and so on. And one of those lectures is about how the standard of care fails athletes. And you are not a normal person. So the problem is, is when the doctor says you can go back to normal activity, what, what, what the doctor means is you can go back to what is normal activity for the other people you saw in the waiting room, you know, for, <laughs> right. that, for that yeah. little old lady yeah. over there, the guy that, you know, right. drives a cab and does not exercise at all. You can go back to their level of normal activity, but normal activity for you is something different. And so to think yeah. that what is normal for most Americans is going to be the same as a national champion athlete is completely absurd. Um, yeah. but that's the problem is that, you know, we're trained as physicians to treat a specific thing and to heal one part, irrespective of the rest of the entire system and what's going to happen later. And that's very, very difficult. But, you know, you touched on a couple of things that were really worthwhile there and interesting. And one of them is just that you kind of didn't really have pain when you were exercising, but then it would be killing you afterwards. So, you know, you have endorphins, of course, that, after your warm up, you're starting to get these endorphins in your system. You can then exercise and work out, and the perineal tendons don't actually hurt while you're doing that athletic activity, but you are doing damage. You're irritating them. You're potentially making a split or a tear in the tendon worse. It's getting more inflamed. The synovial tissue around the tendons is getting more inflamed while you're doing that, but it doesn't bother you while you're exercising. So you think it's okay. But as soon as you're done and those endorphins start to drop off, the pain level goes up, signaling that the fact that you had been injuring it basically while you're doing that activity, but you want to believe that it's going to be fine. And any sign that confirms that you might actually be okay, we grasp onto that and we hold on to it and we do not want to let go of it. So I think that makes it really difficult. I think that's part of why many athletes with perineal tendonitis don't seem to recognize those initial signs of injuries. Obviously, the sooner we recognize an injury when there's tissue damage, the easier it is to prevent that tissue damage and prevent the injury from getting worse. So now with all you know, if you think back to when all of this stuff started, when you were first having pain, before you went to see the doctor, when you really knew it was messed up, what were really the first signs that something was going wrong with your perineal tendons? Uh, the first signs I would say was the um slight bit of discomfort and pain underneath the left ankle bone. So in the perineal area, mm -hmm. so the, just, just a little bit of pain after jumping. So not so and, much and while you're know, doing it. Yeah. But just really after. Right. Well, you know, I really did get to the point. I don't know how much you know about high jump, but I really did get to the point where, yeah, I remember jumping at the um, North and South American Championships in Costa Rica in 2014, and I jumped 17 times on in that event to win it. And by 2018, I got to the point where I had about four jumps in me. Mm. So I needed to go in at a very high height in order to only jump, say, four times. So that should have told me <laughs> that things maybe weren't going well. So yes, it, it, you know what it was? It was, it was, and maybe some of your listeners can also relate to this. If, if you start adjusting your, comp your, your competitive form, your competitive behavior uh, to compensate for some, some odd pain that you're having and you're not quite sure what it is, that is a point when you need to listen to the side of your brain that's saying, I hurt. Mm, that's a you good know, point. When you, start, you start adjusting how you, how you compete. So in my case, I was saying, okay, let's really look at this. It's a very high jump can also be very strategic. Um, I've only got four jumps here. Where am I going to come in and where do I want to be? So um, when you, that, that would be some advice when you, because obviously, as competitive athletes, elite athletes who have rankings and uh, sponsors and financial commitments in this game, it's very hard to listen to the brain, the part of the brain that says you need to pull back. So 
if you're changing how you compete in order to compensate for an injury, you need to really pay attention to that. I would mm-hmm. say that. Oh, that's really useful. And, you know, I'm trying to help people understand, you know, what it is that signals this injury. And I know that, you know, for you, it seemed really odd. You only had it in this sort of minor portion of your jumping initially. And and then it also didn't really hurt that much when you were training. And, you know, it's so it's, after, it's difficult. Oh, after I, yeah. When, when I would come home after my time at the track, I had to warm it. I had to warm it up in quotes. Mm-hmm. And looking back, now I know what it was. <laughs> right. Well, you know, looking back makes it easier and hindsight's twenty twenty. So it is easy now to look back and see uh, what mistakes you think you were making, what you could have done differently. And obviously that's not going to help you or your perineal tendons today. But there are most definitely people listening right now who have some sort of vague issues with this, you know, weird ankle pain. They've already looked it up and they found some information about perineal tendons and they think maybe it's perineal tendonitis, maybe it's the perineus brevis, maybe it's the longness, they don't know, but you know, hopefully they can learn from you today. So if you could go back in time and do it over, given the stories that you've talked about with the difficulty you had, how you were noticing that it was painful, you had to start shifting your routine, so you had to warm it up, you had to massage it for 24 hours, you had to actually alternate your style and your approach and competition to accommodate and compensate for this injury that you knew was really brewing, if you could go back and do it over, what would you do differently? Well, um, you know, I tell my son that sports is a lifelong experience. It doesn't end in high school. It doesn't end in college. That sport, I'm, I'm a living testimony to the fact that you can compete well into your older years. So what I would say to someone that that's dealing with this is, is stop and give yourself time to heal. Um, Because there's always going to be a new age group ahead of you. And there's always going to be another competition. So they will be there, they will wait, take the time to stop and heal. um, So that you can, in fact, have a, a lifelong experience and have a lifelong journey in sports rather than having to, you know, shut it down for a longer period or have to change to another activity. Um, that That's what I would say. Me, I'm, you know, because I'm really looking forward to my next age group. Uh, and um, that's, that's what I'm focused on. So that that's what I would recommend to your, to your listeners. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. And, uh, you know, you touched on this uh, quite a bit about how we have this sort of idea of investment, whether it's time, money, the number of hours we put into training or whatever, you know, even our, our base fitness, we feel like that's this investment that we built on. We do not want to lose it. And so I really believe one of the biggest fears of most injured runners is that if they just, you know, lay off like that doctor told you that we think we're going to lose all of our fitness and then we'll be in trouble. And you know, I think the most important message I have for injured runners to hear is that you do not have to lose all of your fitness while you recover. You really have one injured part. If it's just your perineus brevis tendon, yes, you might have to do some stuff to modify your training to let that thing heal, but you can maintain your fitness. So what are the things that you did in particular to maintain all of your athletic fitness as you kind of did, you know, when, when you're in the boot, when you were getting back to fitness, like what did you do to maintain your overall fitness? I mean, I know you didn't, I, I would imagine you didn't just put on the boot and sit on the couch for a month. So what did you do to maintain your fitness through that period of injury? Yeah, I did not put on the boot and sit on the couch for a month. <laughs> and yeah. and um, it drove me crazy. And I'm sure everybody feels that way. It drives them crazy. You know, those boots are amazing. So I don't highly recommend them now with what I know. But even if you are in a boot for a short period of time, you can still do ab work. You can still do upper body weight. There are many things you can still do. I got into deep water running. And deep water running is a good workout. Um, Maybe some of your listeners know about that. You put on a a buoyancy belt and that will give you a really good workout and will keep your cardio up. Um, During the summers, I swim because we have a local pool that's open, um, swim laps. I try to do that. But I will tell you that I got back to weight training in 2019 because I started to realize how important that was. So you need a good 
weight training coach to continue to keep your strength um, because, you know, to a certain extent, running, jumping, competing, it, it's all about strength and the strength to go the distance, the strength to run the hill, the strength to run 100 meters, whatever. Um, so, so that's the other way I kept it was, was returning to my weight co- coach so that I could, again, start to feel like I could lift a bus <laughs> like mm-hmm. I did in 2017. Yeah, that's great. So. I mean, you, and you do need a coach, so, uh, it's not just going to the gym and finding some ways, no, I think, you know, yeah. yeah. So having a coach will definitely make that more effective training for sure. Um, all right. So we all know that when it comes to training, if we are really going to maximize our personal physiologic capacity for athletic achievement, the goal is to get as close to your sort of threshold for injury without stepping over that line. And so in that respect, any athlete who is in the midst of training, if actually training at maximum capacity, is theoretically always on the edge of developing an overtraining injury. So for that person right now who's listening, who may be in this vulnerable place, who may be hearing you but not actually listening to their own body, what advice can you share? I mean, what would you say to help someone listen to their body and lay off when appropriate while a muscle or tendon is healing? Well, I would say that, um, you know, your, your running and your fitness is a lifelong endeavor. And you need to focus on the bigger picture. Um, don't let this week's injury or this month's injury take away you, the joy that you will have doing this for a lifetime. So there's no shame in having an injury. Take a moment and let your body heal because you want to be able to do this for a very long time. And um, that's the kind of suggestion I would say I would, I would offer. Um, hopefully my experience can help someone else listen to their body and, and lay off of it so that they can do this for a longer period of time. Well, that's good advice. And I've actually never heard that, but I think the statement that you made that there is no shame in injury is really, really important. And because I think a lot of people perceive that we think of uh, an injury as some sign of weakness, you know, a failure where you put all these labels on it that are really counterproductive, frankly, and we have to accept it for what it is. You know, it's a, it's a piece of injured tissue. That's it. So, uh, so what's going on for you now? What is next on your calendar for competition? Where are you going next? Well, I am 59 and I will be 60 next year, which for uh, master's athletes is super exciting. You get to age into a new age group. And so I'm going to be in the bottom of the heap next year in a good way. I'll, I'll be 60. So 59 was actually a good year to be injured in a way. Mm. Um, and so, um, so I look forward to indoor nationals um, early next year, and I'm going to be continuing to swim and continuing to rate, weight train and continuing to do my acupuncture and my CBD cream and all the stuff that I'm doing to try to heal this perineal tendon. Um, I will continue to you know, promote track and field and um, the master's track and field because it's so awesome to have a second chance of co- at competition. It is awesome. All right. So for all of our listeners right now who want to follow you, who want to you know, keep up with your journey of going after the indoor nationals and your new age group uh, in 2020, what's the best place for them to find you? Probably the best place is on Instagram at Julia Jumping. They can also find me at my blog, which is now it gets interesting.weebly.com. And it's named that because I truly believe that once you hit 40, life does get much more interesting. The older I get, the better I get. And I I feel more people need to understand that. You can also find me on Twitter at Julia Curran. Fantastic. All right, Julia. So I really appreciate you coming on the show today, sharing your experience, your insights, and uh, it really has been great having you on the show today. So again, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come on the show today. Thanks for having me on here. I, I appreciate what you do for the running community. You're awesome. Thank you so much. Doc on the Run. We help injured runners run.